Okay, ready? Okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you very, very much for coming. We're still letting people in. Um, my name is Trisha Callender, and I am the anti-racism lead for NGO CSW 65. I am also the global coordinator for the Civil Society Advisory Group to Generation Equality Forum. First, some housekeeping issues. If everybody who is not a panelist would please mute. Um, that will really be an effective way to make sure that everybody is heard and that the conversation goes smoothly. The chat is open. So if there are any questions that you have um, during the session, we, there will be a question and answer session towards the end. Um, but in the meantime, if you, are, if you would like to communicate in that way, that is available to you as well. And um, we have Olivia um, Ali and myself. So if there are any um, significant issues or emergencies, please feel free to send us a private message. And so with that, um, I will introduce um, why we're doing this topic and then hand it over to uh, Dr. Minnie Murthy, who will actually be the moderator for this session. And I will keep my comments brief because as you can see, there are a lot of experts on the panel and they have a lot to share with you. And so I don't wanna eat up the time, but I will express that I am beyond thrilled that we are doing this panel. When we first decided to explore the topic of anti-racism for NGO CSW 65, we knew that we had to respond to what was happening on the ground, but quite frankly, there was not necessarily a, an infrastructure built into the UN structure to really explore this. And so we had in, in some way free reign to really um, look at issues. There's so many, but look at intersectional issues that were plaguing different groups, um, black and brown people all over the world. One of the interesting things, I'm a sociologist by training, one of the particularly interesting things about studying um, inequality um, in all of its forms, gender, race, et cetera, is that there's always a way when you look at the statistics to make the case, if you so choose, that, well, it may not be gender, it might be X. Well, it may not be race, it might be X. And so things get obfuscated and it's really hard to disaggregate that data and, and um, make that point unassailably. I mean, obviously you can make the point, but there's always a, well, maybe. This is an exception. Um, maternal health, particularly in the United States where I live, um, the data is very clear. It doesn't matter um, it, what your socioeconomic status is. It's not obfuscated by socioeconomic status. It's not obfuscated um, by location and a whole bunch of other mitigating factors. It really comes down to, to race. Um, it is unique, this field is unique in that way that you're, it, it actually, from a data standpoint, it is very clear that no matter who you are, if you are a black or a brown woman, you will have trouble when you, more likely than not, in some cases, 10 to 20 times as much, having a good medical experience as opposed to a white counterpart, even if they're in a way lower socioeconomic category than you are. And I found that particularly interesting, sobering, and I thought it would be a good exemplar for what we're trying to show. Now, again, this is not the only inequality, but it is one that you can't make the case that there's any other reason. And so with that, we have assembled a wonderful group of doctors and doulas and academics and some traversing two or three of those categories to have this conversation. And Dr. Minnie Murthy, and I would let um, her introduce herself, um, will be moderating this session. And we really, really look forward to your engagement. We're hoping for a lively and spirited discussion um, full of inquiry and a renewed spirit in when addressing gender inequality to put this front and center. So with that, I hand the floor over to the wonderful Dr. Padmini Murthy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Callender. Uh, greetings, everybody from New York. So good morning, good evening, good night, whichever time zone you're in, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. This is really important because it's, as Trisha put it so rightly, it's just not about gender, it's also about race. So it's compounded here. And that's why it's really my honor and privilege to moderate this panel with uh, so many esteemed panelists from diverse backgrounds. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a few housekeeping rules, please. 
Uh, those of you who are not speaking, kindly mute yourselves. And also, please do not talk on the phone with your mic on because it's so disconcerting for our speakers. It has happened all the time. And if you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat and they will be addressed accordingly. We have five fabulous panelists here and uh, they each of them will have 10 to 11 minutes. I will be asking them each three questions and I will very briefly introduce our panelists because they are, if I started introducing each panelist, it would take up much more than what the time we have. Uh, very briefly, a one minute introduction about myself. My name is Dr. Padmini Murthy. I'm known as Mini, and I'm a physician, a professor, and an activist, and a mom, and a writer in that order. And maternal health is something I feel very strongly about because unfortunately, this has been pushed to the bottom of the pile in so many societies and countries we come from. Uh, I would like to give our audience a very short introduction as to why we are discussing this today in the United States. So unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, significant racial and ethnic disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity exist in the United States. A study, several studies found uh, that black women are three to four times more likely to die a pregnancy related death as compared to white women. And unfortunately, for every maternal death in the United States, 100 women suffer a severe obstetric morbidity, a life threatening diagnosis, or need to undergo a life saving, life -saving procedure during their delivery and hospitalization. Again, severe maternal morbid morbidity affects over 60,000 women, ladies and gentlemen, it's not six, not 600, not 6,000, but 60,000 women annually in the United States, and unfortunately has been rising during the past decades. In fact, non-Hispanic Black women have the highest rates for 22 of 25 severe morbidity indicators used by the Centers for Disease Control to monitor population estimates for severe, severe maternal morbidity. So this just highlights how severe the problem is. It's not something we just like, okay, it's because maybe it's where they are, what is going on, but this is real. We need to take action now. Given these disturbing trends, growing attention has now been focused. And it's terrible that in the United States, that the risk of pregnancy related death for a black woman or a brown woman in some regions of our country is similar to the risk faced by women in some developing countries. So this is really real and it's just not in those countries, it's very much here in the United States. And it's not to take away from the global picture, but we also wanted to bring to attention that in one of the richest countries in the world, the United States of America, this problem exists and has existed and unfortunately is still here. And to address this, this needs work by people across all sectors. So it's really great that last year on the 9th of March, 2020, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2020 was introduced by Representative Lauren Underwood from Illinois. So, and fast forward this year, February 8th, 2021, Senator Booker Lauren Underwood, uh, Representative Adams, along with Senators Duckworth, Gillibrand, our own New York Senator, and I had the privilege of being on a panel with her. She sent us a recorded message uh, uh, during a women's, uh, uh, International Women's Day to talk about her support for this act. Uh, so this came together with so, the support of so many people, both Congress, uh, women, men, and senators, and they unveiled the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021. It's a historic legislation, ladies and gentlemen, in the United States to save mom's lives and racial and ethnic disparities in maternal health outcomes 
and achieve maternal justice. We have social justice. The term maternal justice is equally important so that there is maternal health justice for black women and all women and the uh, and birthing uh, you know, women of uh, uh, women. So black women and brown women. So this is very important. And it builds on an existing maternal health legislation and the black uh, maternal health omnibus of 2020, which I just, uh, you know, uh, described. So bottom line, the time is now, the time is right. We need to act now. So we look forward to this fabulous panel discussion. And um, our first speaker of the today is Dr. Camille Clare. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Camille Clare. And I've had the privilege of knowing Camille as a student, a dear colleague and a dear friend. And I really applaud all the work she's doing with her dedication and compassion. She currently is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University College of Medicine and also um, <clears throat> the School of Public Health. She is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, is a very active member of ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and has served uh, in many leadership roles in this organization and other organizations. Currently, she serves as the ACOG District 2 Chair, and in 2020, she received the ACOG District 2 Distinguished Service uh, Award. And thank you so much, Dr. Claire, for being with us today and sharing your valuable insights in spite of your uh, <clears throat> schedule. And I just want to give a shout out because she's going to be lobbying for maternal health right after this call. So over to you, Dr. Claire. So my first question to you is, Please share what you think are the main factors contributing to disparities in maternal health among black and brown women at present in the US. And, this, and what are the factors which are leading to the high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity? Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. The Thank mic you. is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Murthy and my co uh, fellow colleagues for the opportunity to speak on this issue, which um, I've uh, really devoted majority of my career to. Uh, what Dr. Murthy didn't mention, I also had served as the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at my previous institution. And so figuring out ways to educate students um, from this anti-racism lens is really, really important. So I think the issue that you mentioned is extremely critical as well as multifactorial, um, but there is a huge role that structural racism and institutional racism does play um, in, in these disparities uh, in black and brown and indigenous uh, women so or, or people. So I think uh, we have a lot of work to do um, in this area. I think the social determinants of health do not just arise on their own, but are really based or, or, fr or, or rooted in the historical social factors that have brought um, particularly black uh, individuals to the United States against their will, <coughs> excuse me, dating back into the 1600s. So I think we need to look at that racial oppression, class oppression, uh, social oppression in figuring out where these uh, social determinants came from and what we need to do uh, from a policy perspective in order to address that. I do sit on the New York State and the New York City Maternal Mortality Review Board. And not that I can speak to individual cases because all that we learn from each individual um, mom who has passed away, but really factoring into how bias and discrimination um, has impacted their, their care or their lack of care and what we need to do uh, to address that, to better listen to the voices of the patients that we serve. So hopefully that, that answers your question and, and the work continues so we can figure out how we can address uh, that, that, that racial equity lens that's so important. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for those insights. It's really important. Um, and as you said that we have so many factors uh, and uh, looking at that through this lens of making sure how each of these can be addressed individually and collectively is so important. Um, <clears throat> so my next question to you, Dr. Eclair, and the reason I'm asking each uh, panelist the three questions at this uh, one after the other is because some of our panelists, including Dr. Claire, need to leave earlier. So that's why instead of going through the round robin, uh, I'm making sure everybody is there. So I haven't forgotten anybody, but to make sure that everybody gets the time to answer and we have a good conversation as a segue to an equally important discussion where all your input is much appreciated. So moving on. So uh, Camille, I can call you Camille. I mean, it's uh, thank you so much. We're having a conversation. And, you know, uh, um, can you briefly discuss your professional op and personal experiences which have made you such a passionate advocate for promoting equal access and equity to access and delivery of maternal health services? Thank you. Th thank you for that question. You know, I actually, uh, I'm a child of immigrant uh, parents. My parents immigrated to the United States from Jamaica, West Indies. They've actually been in the United States longer than they were on the own, their own country of origin by now. Um, but so I went to medical school, particularly to take care of underserved patients. I grew up in the Northeast Bronx, where actually the majority of Jamaicans who emigrated to, to the United States, they only went into three small areas. So the Northeast Bronx, uh, a small area in Brooklyn and Florida, small area in Florida. So, um, so because of my background, that really always gave me an interest in taking care of those that were uh, underserved from, from the beginning of medical school. And then when I went into obstetrics and gynecology, and particularly I took care of women um, in, New in uh, East Harlem, Spanish Harlem for the majority of my career and now here in central Brooklyn. So really I'm extremely passionate. I was an advocate and an activist really to, to better serve my patients and how, how they can do better. I worked in very under-resourced uh, hospital systems um, but that, that's no excuse for us not to be able to elevate for excellent care for the patients. So, um, and we know that there are such things as black serving versus white serving hospitals. And so how uh, those institutions can be better resourced, not because of the individuals or the healthcare professionals that are taking care of them, they are doing their 100% best in order to give them the care that they deserve and that they more than deserve. Um, but these, these um, institutions are very, very extremely under-resourced. So um, again, how we can continue to fight for resources for our communities that are underserved is extremely important. Um, I think this discussion is very important. Working with all types of birth workers are uh, to, to and, and focusing on the community aspects are really important. So not just within the healthcare institution, but outside of it. Um, and, and I think that's that's been the reason for me wanting to continue to do this work. There are others that are better than I am in, in addressing the issues that my patients need and so how we can work collaboratively. So I'm so thankful for my fellow colleagues on the on this panel to really help us to, to take uh, the best care of patients that we can. So hopefully um, that addressed uh, your question, Dr. Murthy. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. And just to add, I think you bring up a very important thing because it's not a, us versus them. You know, it's the, what shall I say? It's the collective efforts and the advocacy and the commitment of us physicians, nurses, doulas, academics, sociologists, PhDs, and concerned citizens to make sure that the playing level is the same. So I think you bring up very important issues. And also I would like to, um, before I ask you my third question, just say that um, I do appreciate all the work you did with me on the Safe um, Malawi Motherhood Project as a student um, in uh, New York Medical College and, it, and your insights and, uh, you know, commitment of so many of uh, our uh, uh, 
faculty and students brought this. So again, this is a collective effort. And uh, the one thing is advocacy has no race, folks. It is universal. It's only one term advocacy and commitment. So we need to keep this free and continue with the work. So my last question to you, Dr. Claire, is, you know, if you're around after um, we finish the questions and we have questions, then we will get back to you. But for now, for the panel, what is your call to action? Take away message. And what can we do collectively to address this issue, which unfortunately is on the back burner? Your insights, please. Thank you. Well, I think what we learned from, uh, from the COVID pandemic, in addition to the racial injustice that we saw throughout the country in 2020, is that we all have a role to play. Um, as mentioned, I will be lobbying on the virtual Hill today with my legislators uh, from my state, New York State, as well as my local community. So that's one thing that I am particularly doing. So not only taking care of my patients, but really speaking to those policymakers, right? Who have the, the power to make those changes Several of those policymakers that I we spoke to yesterday were physicians, actually, who are in Congress and have the same equal uh, training that I did, but can speak to the larger issues. So my call to action for everyone in being a reproductive justice advocate is what you are doing. You are already doing this work locally for your, your clients or your patients and then on a broader basis. So how can you meet with your legislators? How can you talk to your community? How can you elevate the, the issues that they have? What are the needs? That is what my call to action has been for myself personally. And I implore you to do, do the same work. Go online, go look up uh, who is your legislator in your local community. Go ahead and vote when it's time. We, we know the impact of that um, this year and so, um, those are some things that I would implore you to, to do. So thanks so much for the opportunity, uh, Minnie, Dr. Murthy, and um, I look forward to hearing from my colleagues because I learn from everyone when I participate on these panels. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire. <clears throat> Camille, it's always great to you know, interact with you. Uh, and one of the things is you, uh, just to add on to what you said before I turn on to our next esteemed speaker is, I tell everybody, whether it's students or anybody who asks me, what is the thing which pushes you to do what you do or for what we do is our commitment and positivity. We need to believe that it's going to happen. It's not like a little child believing in a miracle, but positive uh, attitude is half the battle won. And also to add to what you said, I might like to say we all need a single minute elevator pitch about advocacy. If we meet somebody, the one minute pitch, because now everybody's reading span has come down because we are in the Twitter world tweeting, you know, not more than so many characters. So a one minute elevator pitch. And thank you again so much and all the best for your, uh, you know, all the work you do. And I'm so glad you're representing so many women because it's just not the practice of medicine. It's important to make people realize how can we move forward. So thank you again. Our next speaker today is Dr. Damali Campbell, who is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and also addiction medicine. And for more than two decades, Dr. Campbell has been a champion of addressing the needs of women in underserved areas. And she has been focused on addressing social determinants of health and their impact on the health of women, maternal health, and also sees the importance of optimal nutrition education in urban settings. Over to you, Dr. Campbell. Thank you so much for taking your time. Again, my apologies to everybody because everybody's bios are so fascinating and long. You just have to pick what is relevant for this topic. But again, you are very welcome to look up the work being done by our esteemed panelists online and see what a rich tapestry they bring to this panel. So Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for your time. 
my first question to you is, please share what you think are the main factors contributing to the disparities in maternal health among black and brown women at present in the US and also during your work for over two decades, can you discuss what are some of the factors you see as leading to these high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity? Thank you, over to you. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you, Olivia, for bringing up the presentation. Um, I will be um, quite brief, but I wanna thank you for having me participate in this conversation, please do feel free to call me Domily, um, especially in March as we celebrate Women's History Month in the United States. Um, next slide. So maternal mortality is seen as a general indicator of the overall health status of a population, the status of women, and how well the health system functions in a country. The United States has the higher, has the highest maternal mortality than most other industrialized nation. But what is most disturbing is that this rate is rising. Uh, one of the things that this graph doesn't predict, uh, depict, you know, there are disparities in every country, but these disparities are generally based on access to care and income inequalities that impact many social determinants of health, like housing, healthy foods, and clean water. In the next slide, uh, this is 2018 data that highlights some of the statistics already shown that Black women are three to four times more likely than their non-white, uh, than their non-Hispanic white counterparts um, to die from maternal mortality. And I believe that racism and implicit bias are additional factors that have to be addressed with our solutions. Next slide. What is clear and disturbing is that even with attaining higher education and achieving the highest levels of socioeconomic status, um, that does not mitigate or protect us from these poor health outcomes. What? Why? Next slide. So these two graphs are meant to point out the stark economic um, differences. On the left, the income gaps were looked at over several years, the year 2000, the year 2007, and the year 2018. Not only do we see that the income gap exists between Blacks and whites, but it widens for college educated persons and persons with advanced degrees. On the right, the median wage, in, uh, median wage growth for Black women has leveled and even declined in 2010, despite economy-wide productivity growth. The conclusion that I take away from this is as Black women, we make less money even when we have the education and are doing the same job. Next slide. So you're all here because you care about maternal mortality. Um, and as Dr. Murthy pointed out, um, there's also maternal morbidity because there's tenfold of women who experience near death complications that impact the rest of their lives. On the left, we have pictures of Dr. Shalon Irving, a CDC epidemiologist, and Dr. Shanice Wallace, a pediatric chief resident in Indiana, that remind us that privilege of education and steady income do not fully protect us. On the right, um, again, for every woman who dies in childbirth, many more come close. And clearly both mortality and morbidity um, uh, impact not only the lives of those individual persons, but their families as well. And so we see Samantha Blackwell, um, but also Serena Williams that everybody knows who suffered uh, severe maternal morbidity. Next slide. 
And so, you know, in terms of thinking about all of the factors, uh, those social determinants of health, how income affects housing, how income affects food security, transportation, economic stability, access, uh, time off, evidence, uh, air and water quality, neighborhood safety, um, all of those things uh, need to be addressed. But also implicit bias and structural racism in our healthcare system needs to be addressed. Next slide. And lastly, just in thinking about some of the solutions, uh, you know, addressing structural and systemic racism, I believe incorporating midwifery care into practices as a more holistic care and patient-centered care, uh, trying to make all women, um, we do have some women that have chronic medical illnesses that need to be cared for by physicians. So we still need our medical practices to have better access, to be patient focused. And with some of my colleagues at the New Jersey Medical School, we're working on something called the equity birth plan, which really uh, focuses the patient's medical issues and make sure that we address factors, not only on a patient level, but on a provider level, on a community level, as well as on a systems level. We need to listen to birthing people more, and we need to provide a supportive environment for birthing people, not only during pregnancy, but before and after pregnancy. And that includes doula care, um, helping birthing people, and all people to focus on self-care and wellness, which is not only physical, but also emotional and stress reduction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. I mean, you know, you summed it up so well. As I said, you wove a rich tapestry there of uh, putting all the social determinant factors. So um, to sum up very briefly what you said, you discussed the patient factors here, the socio-demographic, age, education, poverty level, income. And you also talked about how important it is to have psychosocial effort <clears throat> support and what the community and neighborhood can do. And you talked about this plan. So this just shows it's not one person doing it. It's so many people coming together. I think that's a beautiful illustration for everybody to see how teamwork really pays off. And it's a winner all through because it makes the people who do the work feel good. It makes the community and also the individuals. And also, as you said, providers need to be educated. That's a very crucial point you raised and also have cultural competence. So thank you so much. Now, moving on to the second question, and I'm sure we all look forward to what you're going to uh, share with us. Can you briefly discuss the personal or professional experience which had such a profound impact on you, which made you an advocate for promoting equal access and equity um, for delivery and access of maternal health services? Thank you. Sure. Um, well, there were a couple things. Um, number one, I hail from the borough of Brooklyn. Um, and <laughs> you know, just kind of growing up, um, I watched my mom um, have experiences with the medical system, having had uh, several miscarriages. I also um, have several sisters. And I myself, um, even being a physician, have had my own interactions with the medical system. Um, and a few of those experiences include um, you know, I'm, if anybody who knows me knows I'm kind of a person that likes to fly underneath the radar. I'm just, you know, I, I'm who I am and I believe people, all people should be treated as human beings. So I don't come in saying I'm Dr. So-and-so, I just come in as Domily. And so when you tell someone, you know, if you're gonna put that I, IV, I think you better try the right side. Uh, well, why you, why do you, how do you know that, you know? Do you work in a hospital? Yes, I do. What do you, are you a nurse? Are you housekeeping? Are you a respiratory? They never get to, you know, uh, they, they can never imagine that uh, you could be a physician. 
And so those experiences really have shaped me to want to just um, because of my background and upbringing, just believing um, that golden rule that we treat people the way we want to be treated. Thank you so much. That is so true. And you speak for so many of us who have experienced uh, similar bias because not uh, believing that, yes, a woman um, of color is not competent enough or does not have the professional skills to make you feel better. So I think that's really very important. And the third question to you. Uh, call to action takeaway. What do you recommend we can do collectively as a global community, both locally, statewide? I mean, you, we are, I'm from New York, you're from New Jersey, but what can we do collectively or somebody from Baltimore to address this issue? As I have said before, it's really on the back burner. Thank you again for your valuable insights. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We all know people. We all have relatives. We all have cousins. We all have friends. Uh, we work with other. Um, we work with other people, um, and so I believe just in interactions and checking in um, and asking people how they're doing. You know, are you asking questions? Are you making sure? You know, we have to empower other women, other people to ask questions and to make sure that they have the information they need. Thank you so much. So communication and listening are crucial. Thank you. And I'm sure everybody is all years listening to you and Dr. Claire speak before you. Thank you again, both of you. And now we move on. Um, the third speaker I have the privilege of introducing is Ms. Chanel Portia Albert, who is the founder and executive director of Ancient Song Jeweler Services. Uh, which is a reproductive health organization uh, focused on providing resources and full spectrum of doula services to women of color and marginalized communities. In addition, uh, Ms. Portia um, Albert serves as member of the New York City Commission on Gender Equity. Thank you so much for your time. And again, my first question is, could you please share as uh, you know, based on your work as a doula, what do you think are the main factors contributing to disparities in maternal health among black and brown women at present in the US? And what do you see as some of the leading causes contributing to this? Over to you, thank you. <laughs> Greetings everyone. Thank you for having me this morning. I'm super excited to be here with all of you in this wonderful panel. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just get straight to the point and just say that um, I believe one of, the, one of the major factors is white supremacist um, practices and easy, um, ideologies that have um, been allowed to continue to perpetuate themselves throughout the US healthcare infrastructure, um, not just within US healthcare, but in all of the infrastructures within the United States. So when we start to look at the ways in which education housing, um, food insecurity or food apartheid, when we start to look at um, the ways in which people are allowed to express themselves in their cultural identity and what that means to them, all of these things have been encroached upon by, again, white supremacist ideologies. And so when we start to look at the US healthcare infrastructure, we're looking at a history like some of my colleagues um, and fellow panelists have said um, that stems back from the early um, 1600s in the enslavement of African peoples, right? We're looking at um, how medicine was created off of the backs of enslaved African women and the ways in which science perpetuated a narrative that we don't feel pain the same way, our bodies don't function in the same manner, but yet we were able to, our bodies were used for the advancement of sciences that are still used to this present day. Um, when we look at the very pivotal moments throughout history, such as the reconstruction era, when we start to look at, um, when we look at Jim Crow era, right? All of these things, when we look at, you know, um, the civil rights era, all of these other institutions, um, such as education and others, were addressing um, separate but equal. They were uh, um, addressing the ways in which 
um, black, brown, and indigenous people didn't have the same levels of access to care. But what they didn't address is what does it mean for them once they are in these places to actually get care that is coming from an anti-racist perspective, that is coming from a human-centered perspective, that is coming from a place where we're seeing the humanity in individuals um, and it's reflected back at them. Right. And so what I continue to see is the perpetuation of the dehumanization of the black and brown body um, that continues to play its roles based on these continued perp perpetuation of ideologies that continue throughout the education of providers throughout all of the spectrum. So we're not just talking about physicians, we're talking about nurses, we're talking about even when folks are going into midwifery school, when we're talking about um, um, educate, you know, just all forms of education, access to services, right? And so when I go into a birth room and I, and I'm working with someone and, you know, my primary role should be to center human connection, right? As a doula to offer emotional and physical support, right? But it also, when you are working with black, brown and indigenous communities, you have to also incorporate advocacy. What does it mean for someone to center their bodily autonomy and their basic human rights within their birthing experience as an individual who is pregnant, who is bringing life forth into the, into the world, but also who is getting ready to be a parent? Right, understanding how these these situations have long consequences for the ways in which people are able to show up and parent their children in loving and affirming ways. And so it's not about just looking at better health outcomes where we see we have a healthy um, parent and we have a healthy child. It's also about the, the continued experiences of a birth outcome can also be something that is traumatic based on the experiences that someone has had based on the infliction of racism and bias and how it continues to perpetuate itself, right? And it's not just coming from white providers, it's also coming from providers of color who are also institutionalized within the framework that does not center um, what it means to provide care from um, a non-judgmental anti-racist medical framework. And so, you know, that's one part of it. The other part of it I see is insurance segregation and the ways in which insurance dictates um, someone's access to being able to have quality health care. The other portion of it is the healthcare infrastructure as a whole and the ways in which when we start to look at, we want to talk about, you know, there's a lot of um, having worked also in Uganda as a maternal health strategist. Um, I realized what it means to, you may be in a population where you say that someone is in a developing country, but what I realized is that what people, what they lack in having maybe certain resources, they have in community. They have in being able to be connected. They have in the supports that are necessary in order to raise a, a loving and affirming family. What we don't have here in the United States or what we do have here is an over, over medicalization of birthing bodies. And we have the perpetuation that you are here, you, you, you had this baby, you do this by yourself, right? When that is not a natural occurrence, right? No one just has a child by themselves and then they send them off to the, to the wind and tell them, go ahead and make that, make that work. Like in every community, there is always a network of support that is established. And so what we need to start to do is we need to move away from this um ideology and this thought pattern of like america is the greatest and because we have all the technologies because if you're using those technologies that are coming in contact and are harm doing more harm than good then are you you are you how can you profess to be so great when it's reflected in the data of how you actually are treating people so this is what i'm seeing every day and then it's also the criminalization of um black and brown people at bedside where you start to see the ways in which someone in just expressing themselves and saying, I don't want this for myself. I don't want this for my child. I don't want this for my family. Their human rights, again, being stripped away from them at that moment. I've seen police officers called on individuals at bedside. I've seen child protective services used as a tool to get someone to conform with medical procedures. I've seen individuals who are just trying to express their religious beliefs and you know, in a, a particular framework who were not listened to and who were forced, forced by force using systems to get them to cohere to something that they did not want to do, or it was told to them that they would lose their children. And so, you know, we have to really look at what does it mean for someone to be in the place, in the position of the patient, 
right? And the, 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 um, the provider role, right? And the institutional role and the framework that doesn't allow, because I don't want it to make it seem like it's just the provider, but it's also the institution that doesn't allow the provider the ability to be able to practice in a way that would affirm them as well. Because then you have providers who come into the work of service of others who are like super passionate, super really want to make change, and then are met with all these different obstacles that they have to face or they're met with um, seeing traumatic birth experiences happen. And then that traumatic experience becomes normalized behavior. And then they begin to perpetuate that in the practices that they have with their other patients. And so we have to also think about what does it mean to support the provider within the institution so that they also have the mental health services, they have the things that they need so that they can really truly provide care in a way that is sustainable. And that also, that, that and because when we do that, we understand that it's not about just that moment, it's about the reflection of what happens outside of that moment that has a ripple effect, um, not just for the individual who is experiencing it, but also for the entire community. Thank you so much for those very powerful remarks, which resonated with everybody. So you brought up two very important issues is dehumanization, human rights. And also I think in what you said brought out the microaggression and macroaggressions we have inbuilt in the system. Because as you, we all are aware, working in this field, there have been cases of women being chained uh, to their beds when giving birth. Hello, any of us who's had a baby or, or witnessed a delivery, where are you going to run? You're giving birth. So this is the total dehumanization you brought about, which is very, and you know, it's such a beautiful compliment what you said to our other two speakers. So and this is a real treat for everybody. At least I am in like, okay, Lulu La La Land, because it resonates so well with what all of us have been pushing for. And you know what? That's why collectively we come together. Now, Channel, get ready for the next question. <laughs> that sounds like, okay, just one quick thing. We are at 9.51. I know. I, I feel like we've been here for three minutes and this happens all the time when we have these really explosive and wonderful presentations. We've got to move faster so that everybody can get a chance to ask questions. So I apologize, but Chanel, I feel like I was just in church. Now I'm on mute. Okay, uh, Tricia, I'm aware, you know, anybody who's had me as a moderator knows that, you know, I like, like you, I keep to time. So Chanel, I'm just going to give you one minute, not to cut you off, but because we have uh, two other speakers to get to, just tell me briefly, what is the one personal or professional experience which made you such a passionate advocate? And my children, I'm a mother of six children. And um, they're the catalyst for everything that I do. I had a home birth midwife with a doula um, who completely changed my life. I, after I had my first home birth with my first child, um, I went and I took a doula training with my son who was three months old in my arms. And it was an amazing, beautiful experience to be around so many black women who were censoring um, and indigenous women who were censoring African and indigenous cultural practices and birthing. And yeah, from there, that was the complete catalyst and my children continue to be that catalyst. Thank you so much. And my last question to you before the Q&A is again, very briefly, give us one phrase as to what your call to action is. Sister, go on. The floor okay, I don't gone. know if I have one phrase, but we need to change healthcare infrastructure that incorporates educational reform to include anti-racist models of care universal health care that removes insurance segregation and impacts reproductive um, health outcomes, accountability measures that divest from institutions that are not addressing racism and bias. We need to listen to Black women. Uh, we need to broaden our reproductive health services to include midwives as primary entry points of care by investing in the education that um, includes free schooling, um, housing, and um, Child care for those who have children who are wait, 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 I'm sorry. An expansion of Medicaid for up to one year and to uplift the Momnibus um, Act that now includes 12 additional bills yeah. from the original nine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Grisilda Rodriguez-Solomon. 
who is a black Dominican mother. She's a professor in the Department of Anthropology, Gender Studies and International Studies in the City College of New York. And Griselda and her twin sister, Miguelina, are the brew of Brooklyn. I hope I pronounced that right. They design yoga workshops. I'm a, a yoga practitioner, so I love the work you're doing. And um, thank you so much because you're using so many ways to address racism and help women. So my question to you, again, please share with us what you think are the main factors contributing to disparities in uh, maternal health among black and brown women and also what you see as the high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity um, and thank you for giving us a very succinct answer thank yes, you yes i will make it short and sweet so greetings good morning everyone um it's my pleasure to be here i mean so many beautiful gems have been dropped um i i think overall for me, the bottom line as an educator is that we there's a lack of just holistic education from primary through medical school. Um, I think that unfortunately, as has been stated, we exist in a society where reproductive health is rooted in the dehumanization of enslaved African women. A lot of us don't know that, that hospitals and the institutionalization of medicine as we know it was built on the backs and wombs of enslaved women and freed women of color, free African women, right? And, and that legacy is seeped in the walls and the ethos of the medical industrial complex. And as Chanel points to Chanel being my teacher, I trained with Ancient Song nine years ago, I'm also a doula, um, is that you have well-meaning, very humanizing, very caring individual doctors and practitioners that are unfortunately caught up in a system that is white supremacist and misogynist. We live in an anti-feminine um, existence, not just anti-women, but anti-feminine way of being, way of thinking. And you see that in the way that pregnant people are treated. I want us to really sit and, I mean, we're all here because we care, but like, it's unfathomable to think about the fact that women, people die while giving birth in one of the most advanced countries in the world. And this is not something that a lot of people know, right? We know this is like speaking to the choir, but a lot of people don't know. I think that there has to be a combination of a restructuring of institutionalized practices as has been stated, and also education. I work with young people from grade school through grad school. And I find that with women, generally speaking in particular, a lot of us do not know enough about our own reproductive health. And this is not blaming the individual, but I find that when we have more access to knowledge about our bodies, we can advocate for ourselves even more. It has to be a two-way street, but I think that the restructuring of the institution of medicine is key here. I also feel that we have to address epigenetics we have to understand that as has been stated, if we know that the foundation of medicine, reproductive medicine in the US was founded on the wombs and back of our African and indigenous ancestors, African in particular, then this is something that women of color, we carry in our DNA. It's not to pathologize us because unfortunately that idea has been used to in a sense, write off black people as being sick. We're just prone, more prone to being sick not because we have a gene that makes us sicker. It is, it is societal factors like ac lack to access of quality foods and mental health um, um, resources that really help us to address the way in which intergenerational trauma shows up. I mean, I've been a doula for almost 10 years and I've worked with women with people that are healthy. And the minute they go into full term, third trimester, all these salient or silent um, conditions that they didn't even know ha they had start to come up. And, and these are things that unfortunately have probably been dormant that pregnancy has brought up, but our medical care system doesn't seem to have the, the infrastructure to be able to address epigenetics in a, in a thorough way. So right now, like um, um, entities like Ancient Song and Ashe Birthing Services and so many other collectives primarily of women of color, we've taken the village approach and we've tried to address this on our own, but there's but so much that we can do. We need all hands on deck. We need white sisters to come on board and advocate, right? I also in particular am really interested in this phenomenon called the Latina paradox, being Dominican myself. When we look at the numbers as, you know, Dr. Campbell presented earlier, um, black women have the, the, the worst statistics when it comes to maternal mortality following white women and then Hispanic or Latina women 
fare better, but there's a paradox because Latinas are multiracial. So what happens to black Latinas? We do not fare and because of colorism, it's usually the darker skinned black Latinas that often fare the worst, but they get lost in the statistics because of anti-blackness. A lot of Latinos don't identify as black, and because statistically, racial statistics are not disaggregated by ethnicity, we don't really know. We don't really know where Black Latinas lie. So I have an added layer of advocacy where I'm really interested in understanding what happens to ethnically Black women that, like Latinas, that oftentimes when we look at these statistics that Latinas are doing even better than white women, the advocacy is not as poignant at it as it should be because they're like, oh, we, they're doing much better. Last point, there's a, a really interesting paradox where um, with this is a study done with West African immigrants. They give birth, West African immigrants, and they fare even better than white women and sometimes better than Latina women. But within one generation, because of micro and macro aggressions due to racism, their daughters often fare equal to their African American counterparts because of the weathering of their body due to race and racism. So, bottom line, this is about racism. We have to address this virus right that is the real virus in our society first and foremost and then a lot of chips will fall into place you know what actually griselda you kind of answered all the three questions that's great so well Wonderful. in one question but just one thing i wanted to add on and then i'm just going to give you one minute to talk about it what you talked about weathering due to racism is so poignant because it's not only it's just not genetics, but it's all the generational right. <clears throat> lack of uh, access, abuse, I use the term abuse, and lack of access. So this is so important. And this is something you call this a pandemic, just to add, it's just like, it's one form of violence against women, gender-based violence, Absolutely. which is a pandemic within a pandemic. So you brought it up very beautifully, thank you. One minute before I move on to our last but not least speaker in any way, call to action. What do you want us to do? Call to action is, um, it, may, it may really seem very simple, but I wholeheartedly believe it. We need more love. We need more truly. I'm not being hand on my heart. Like We need to start existing as human beings with more love and more passion and compassion. And I think it will really drive us to have as much passion as all the panelists have. And yes, I see Chanel putting and hope. I teach and my students that are young, black, Latina women, they tell me I feel so disheartened when I read all these statistics, I'm afraid to have a child. And I always reassure them, you cannot lose hope. You have to have love and know that we need babies. We need women to have babies so humanity can exist, but especially Black women, we need to have more babies in a safe and healthy way. And those that do not have children, but are want to be advocates, our white sisters, our male allies, is love. We have to have more love present because if not, you know, we're going to have this conversation in the next CSW 2031. Hopefully not. Thank you. And also, I would like to add one phrase to that mix. It's respect. You respect yes. yourself, you respect others. It doesn't matter what the skin color is. My daughter, when she was young, once said the color of the skin when she had to give a talk in Brooklyn, she was like six or seven years old, said it's the amount of pigment we have. Why are we fighting? So I just wanted to bring that up here to say that it ties in so well to respect. Thank you so much, Grisilda. Thank you for your passion and everything you do. And Thank our you. last but not least speaker is Dr. Kanika Harris. Dr. Harris, um, uh, who has a PhD, is a health equity strategist and she's based in Washington, DC. See, we love people from other states too. We have them being on our panel. We are so inclusive. We New Yorkers, you know, we have people from New Jersey. We have attendees from all over the world. So Dr. Harris is a, has a very interesting background. She's a mother, a doula, and serves as a public health expert for the DC Mayor's Lactation Com Commission. And her work broadly focuses on social determinants of health, women's health, and Listen to Me is her first film. So thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for taking the time to be on the panel. So I'm just going to shoot these questions at you so you can answer them together, and then we can move on to our Q&A because I see so many people are like, uh, you know, typing uh, questions. And I know Trisha is doing a great job fielding who's going uh, with all the questions. So. 
Can you please share with us what you think are the main factors contributing to the disparities in maternal health among black and brown women at present? And what is the cause for these leading rates of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality? And also discuss your personal and professional experience, which has made you such an advocate for promoting equal access. And thank you earlier for sharing your experience, which was very moving with us. Um, and also your one minute message for what is the call to action. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Hi, everyone. So grateful to be here. Um, I cannot um, overstate anything more than what Chanel has done and Domali and um, uh, Griselda and um, Camille. You guys have summed it up. What I, what I will do um, is kind of add on to that and use my personal story to kind of hone in how this all comes together. So I started my doula training in um, 2005 when I was getting my doctorate at Michigan, um, working primarily in Detroit where there was no support, no black people really wanted to be in Detroit helping black moms. So it really affirmed me, affirmed who I am. I was also working with Arlene Ger Geronimus who has coined the um, term weathering and who does that work? I was working as a research scientist to her. In the midst of all that, I was also dealing with my mom who was dying of heart disease and heart failure. Um, so the stresses of a very competitive program, dealing with my mom that was grieving, I mean, sorry, me grieving, her dying. Um, I became pregnant with twins. And um, I had one of the best doulas in the world, um, Claudia Booker, who passed away um, right before COVID. Um, she's well known for her work. And I was also studying with her. I was working with a midwife who had delivered um, so many of um, my peers birth growing up. And I could not save myself from almost dying, um, trying to deliver twins lost twins at 32 weeks, almost lost my life, was in the ICU. Um, and that's when it just really hit me that um, I am not, for the first time 10 years ago, I was like, I'm not immune to this. And I thought that I could sit here like I am right now, talk to you about all these things um, and just talk about it from like this outside perspective. Like I know social determinants of health matter. I know all these things matter but I'm healthy, I eat right, I have doula care, I have all these things, I'm gonna be protected from this. And I was not. Um, not only that, uh, you know, all of the racism that we talk about in terms of really missing critical time because they stopped and asked me for my insurance card and really trying to humanize myself. Bleeding out to say, uh, where's that insurance card? I'm sorry, I left it at home. And then getting to, another, which Chanel talks about that trauma for physicians are real, getting to, you know, this black woman physician that is taking up my birth. She had just lost someone the day before. She's really trying to save me. She's really trying to save my babies, but she can't because all these things were stacked up against her before she got to me. And um, a year later when I went to the hospital and they do the kind of uh, memorial for all the babies they lost that year, she was there. And she was in tears and she came to me and she wanted to let me know, hey, I was the physician that delivered you that day. And I've experienced this trauma for a year now that I've been trying to deal with with your birth. Um, and so why it was so violent for me, um, being able to connect with her in that way and seeing the other side of that was just so important. And so I think the other thing I wanna say is that um, you know, racism is the air we breathe. We can't go out here and say we don't um, breathe in exhaust or that we, it affects all of us. Um, so when I say that, um, you know, my death certificate for my children said that I only got three prenatal visits. It says that um, I had less than the eighth grade education. And it says that I was not married. All these things are in the vital health records that the CDC uses. My mom's death certificate also said that she was a smoker and she was not. So the bias is even going into the data that we're looking at for this information. 
Um, and um, like I said, everyone else has summed up all the reasons of why so well. Chanel just really drove it home for us. This is a very unpopular maybe solution, but we need reparations. I'm sorry, there's just no other way to undo the level of harm that is happening. Um, I'm also the director of maternal health for the Black Women's Health Imperative. And, you know, we're charged, um, we've been giving a large grant for anti-racism work. The stress of just jumping the hoops to do the anti-racism work, to, to, to do this for white institutions or the hoops that you have to jump to get the money from um, organizations that are jumping on this anti-racism bandwagon is a lot. <laughs> And then like the outcomes sometimes are so small or you don't wanna give us the money to expand the work for over one year or two years. So how much change can we really do? And um, we are our solutions. We all can heal each other. Um, my story doesn't end on a dead note. I, for, miraculously, three years ago, I got pregnant with twins again. Um, these babies came back. They were the same complexion, boy, girl, gender. Um, this time I actually had a male doula. <laughs> um, I had a elder in our community that was also a Chinese herbalist. Um, and he worked with me because I had little time to get these babies. Um, you know, it was the same perpetuation of the story. These babies aren't gonna make it. They're pro you probably will only make it 20 weeks, et cetera. He gave me with through just a lot of different things that also we may not be traditional. He got me to 40 weeks. You know, my babies were born at 40 weeks. Um, healthy, strong, no ICU. I still was not, still experienced issues and trauma during that birth as well. Um, and then the other thing I want to speak on is about Chanel with support. We need support. I am now without my mom. So when we look at these intergenerational traumas, we've got to look at the deaths that we're experiencing. We're losing our parents earlier. We don't, we're losing our aunties earlier. It's just me and my husband. So for me to be able to afford the price of a postpartum doula, um, I, I just went through a lot of depression. It took two years to come out of depression. And it was because I didn't have the support. I was isolated with these twins. Um, and I also have an eight-year-old son. And um, I couldn't afford that $40, $50 an hour for a really good postpartum doula to help me. And I didn't really have that community support where I should have been getting food and nourishment and all these things. And so um, I will say within that reparations, I'm not talking about just giving black people money. I'm talking about giving us the resources and education, healthcare, all these things to take care of ourselves. You know, Martin Luther King was not trying to integrate schools or integrate health cares. He was trying to say, hey, we need the resources for us to support ourselves. Now, if, that's in, if that happens through integration, that's fine, but it doesn't have to happen that way. We just need what we need to support ourselves. And I think we get that, we get that so wrong. Um, and so that's, that's why I can't really figure out another way to undo this without saying, hey, we have to heal ourselves, we have to take care of ourselves and support ourselves. Hey, if you guys wanna jump on the bang rag and allies, great. But we, we, we know what we need to do. We are so missing in terms of the research, in terms of NIH funding research. There's so few of us. There's so few of us in the medical in industry. And again, like Chanel was talking about, you know, things are stacked, stacked up against us when we're in those fields. And so I'll just stop right there because I know we're over. Um, and, you know, that's the best way I can kind of bring light to what our panelist has described so well. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris Kanika, for sharing your, uh, your story. I mean, it moved me again so much as you did the first time you shared it. But uh, before I just turn it over to Trisha to kind of uh, uh, go through the questions and Trisha and I will just like do it together. One thing I just wanted to say, what everybody has brought up is so important. And it's so nice that 
even though people did reiterate the same thing, but it was from different angles and it's amazing. And also before I give it over to Tricia, who's looking at over the questions, we have exactly six, 16 more minutes for Q&A. Uh, we are pretty good. Mm -hmm. I just want to give a big shout out to Tricia, having worked with her for, uh, you know, her passion, mm -hmm. her dedication for doing putting this thing together because this is so important and often it's lost. And also to our wonderful panelists, thank you so much. I'm Indian American. So the way you say thank people is by saying namaste. And now it's like no contact, no high five. So it's a virtual namaste. Thank you so much. And our fabulous team of Devin and um, I think Olivia, uh, Ali, Olivia yeah, had to step Olivia, away. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for all the work behind the scenes and also to CSW and uh, for giving us this podium and everybody for joining. And this has been amazing looking at the comments. And thank you so much. It's been an amazing privilege. And Tricia, over to you. Okay, so um, I would urge everyone um, to please put questions in the chat. There have been so many comments. It's been really hard to keep track of all of them, but I've tried to take screenshots of what I could and continue to bring your questions in, please. So the first question um, is from Julia, who asks, how does age impact a, a birthing person's risk of maternal mortality in the US by race? Dr. Campbell, can I have you? And Dr. Uh, Camille Claire conveys her apologies. She had to run to lobby for everybody. So Dr. Damali Campbell, could I have you answer that question, please? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think that um, it can vary, but you know, uh, we generally think that as we get older, there is an increased prevalence of certain chronic illnesses like diabetes and high blood pressure. But for women who are healthy and don't have any of those medical issues for women um, who exercise regularly um, and are in good medical, you know, good uh, health condition. Um, they have an excellent chance of having uh, a great pregnancy and a great birth. Thank you so much, Tricia. Back to you. Mm -hmm. This question is for um, Griselda. Um, can you speak more about? what happens, I'm just gonna to try to paraphrase this because this question is as long as my arm. Um, can you speak more to what happens um, between an immigrant coming to the country with better maternal outcomes and a first generation person? What I'm not understanding is if this is generational trauma, then how a first generation person would, would absorb that trauma, thus having lower birth outcomes. I hope I've done yes. that question justice. I apologize for the staccato way that I've delivered it. No, it's a really important question. And thank you for asking it. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's profound to look at what racism does to us. And it is what it is, it's racism. Um, even though it is, um, I understand the, per, how perplexing the phenomenon could be because if it's intergenerational, then it's something that exists in all of our bodies as black women, as women of color. But when you go to countries across Africa and Latin America that have their own issues and their own forms of oppression, they often tend to be homogenous in certain ways and the level of isolation and oppression that a person of color experiences is not as profound as if you go to countries like the US or even South Africa that are known to have very stringent like segregation legacies. Um, and I think that the, 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 the profound way in which our bodies are weathered or worn down by racism can be manifest within one generation. The statistics show it. It happens with Mexican women because when you see the statistics of Hispanic or Latina women with regards to maternal mortality being lower than white women, that's because a lot of those numbers are reflective of Mexican immigrants that come from a more communal aspect, like Chanel mentioned earlier, that proverbial village that exists to help a woman while um, pregnant, giving birth, and then raising a child. So they have a level of support that allows them to carry children to term, and they don't experience racism the way that women of color do in the US. But Mexican women, they're younger, they're, they're first generation or their offspring, um, and Puerto Rican women, these are the statistics, that then their daughters have children who are, their daughters born and raised in the US and they don't carry children to term as much as they, their mothers do and their babies are low weight, very similar to African-American women. So, I mean, this is something that 
um, a lot of people find it somehow difficult to understand for some reason, but this is what racism does. It makes us sick. It gets under our skin. It makes our blood boil. You know, racism, race may be a social construct, which is apologists get away with that by saying, why are we fixated on race when it's a social construct? But it, the, the social reality of racism is very real. So as a first generation US born Dominican of an immigrant mother, I'm very committed to making sure that my generations and their generations before, there's some sort of mitigation so that we don't have to experience birth the way that um, you know the younger generation will have to. But even in my peers, out of 10 of my peers, I'm 40 years old, out of 10 of my peers, maybe six of them have had C-sections, right? Healthy women. So this is real, racism is real. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, the next question is, as a white woman concerned with gender equality, what can I do? And I would actually add to this question, and I apologize, just taking liberties with your question, particularly in the gender equality um, international development space, since that's what we're discussing here in NGO CSW. So they, she wants to know what she actually can do. Is this open to anyone to answer? Yes, 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 okay. yes. I was like, this this silence is really awkward. So. <laughs> um, I would say um, a true, I wouldn't say allyship, I would say accomplice um, and working towards being an accomplice in the work, which means that you are actively um, unlearning the learned behaviors that you have in regards to white privilege and the ways in which it shows up in the micro and macro um, lens. From an um, international perspective, again, I always, you know, even as um, someone who was born in the United States of African and indigenous descent, um, when I traveled to the continent, it was always my hope to travel in such a way where I was being mindful of the people who I was coming in contact with. I was being mindful of, um, wanted to create sustainability um, and not take resources or create a codependency in the work that's being done. And so I think that in a, a, from an international lens, as a white person who is coming into a black brown country, if you are doing that, ask the people what it is that they want for themselves. Ask the people what it means for them to create sustainability within um, a lens that continues to offer sustainability because once you're not there, well then what happens? And so we really need to think about, you know, not coming from a safe risk com um, complex where we're like, oh, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna help. I see a problem. Let's 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 try to figure this out. It's what does it mean to ask the people what it is that they actually need, so that it's done in a respectful way that uplifts their cultural identity, who they are as individuals, and creates sustainability. And I believe that's transferred from an international lens, but also within the context of the U.S. Because when you're working within community, you need to add, you need to your your stakeholders are your biggest asset. Are you asking people what they want or are you assuming what they want based on your perception of how you believe someone should be living? Um, and I think that's the best way to be a, a you know accomplice. And then again, coming from a place of being very humble, coming from a place of always knowing that you should be learning from every experience and that you're purposely educating yourself through various different ways and means. Well, thank you. And it doesn't seem that we're going to get to every question, and I apologize. I, they're just too many. Um, so I'm just going to pick a few at random. Somebody here wrote, what are some things we can focus on in the public health sphere that can help to combat some of these issues? I think that might have been largely answered. Um, and then are medical schools working on addressing anti-Black black bias explicitly in the healthcare system? Um, I'll just jump in and I know we have actual doctors working on this, <laughs> um, MD doctors. Um, you know, with Black Women's Health Imperative, we are working on um, developing an anti-racist curriculum for physicians. I just developed one for neonatologists specifically um, to educate them about all the things we've talked about today and more. And also, I think the biggest thing I'm learning about the physician nurses space um, is that it has to be evidence driven and data driven in order for them to really grab onto this and want to make change. But at the same time, 
I'm also working on that we physicians and nurses are overtrained, like they have trainings for everything in these CEC credits. And so it has to be really honed in some kind of accountability approach. Like you, it can't just be a training one off, but what are you gonna do with this training? How are you gonna be accountable for this? How are we gonna follow you over time to make sure that these recommendations are actually being implemented, but just a training to check off your list to say, hey, I've done your implicit bias training or I've done this training is just, it's not gonna work. And so I'm really working within the Black Women's Health Imperative through our funding to develop something that is so much more than just a C um, continuing education credits training, but that we will follow you on the, over time and hold you accountable to making changes. Trisha, I just want to mm -hmm. jump in for 10 seconds to answer that. Yes, we are kind of doing that in medical schools. And I think even uh, Dom Lee would like to answer that. And especially we, we are trying to train our young medical students with also cultural competency and not to kind of take things for granted. So I think slowly but surely, you know, all of us working together and thank you Kanika for your comments. We are all working together and it has to be a multi-sectorial task to address this. And thank you for the question. Yeah, agreed. I would say um, that medical schools are starting to address it, but we need to do more. And we also need um, a history of medicine to discuss some of those historical aspects going back to some of the points that were made about um, Black women being operated on without anesthesia. Like if we don't tell these stories over and over and over again, people forget about them and they don't know uh, where the fears um, of Black persons in the health system come from. They don't understand it. And, and you know, but it, we hear a lot about Tuskegee in regards to COVID, but it's not just Tuskegee. There are many many, many examples of how people of color have been mistreated by the healthcare system. And we have to tell those stories so that as uh, physicians are trained, they can you know, have that knowledge. Trisha, back to you. I think yeah. you have time for one last- I have one more question, that's it. I, I don't know where the time went, this keeps happening to me. Um, question for anyone on the panel, maybe Domaly or Chanel, is there any current research correlating traumatic delivery experiences to decrease breastfeeding and chest feeding in the first six months? Are birthing people still encouraged to breastfeed or chest feed after a near death delivery? I mean, um, I would say yes, uh, we do still uh, recommend um, breastfeeding, but clearly, um, every experience that a person has can impact, um, you know, their experiences uh, going forward. But, um, and I think that we have to have conversations. Um, and if a woman wants to do that, you know, how we can help them to deal with the trauma. So I, I think it's possible, but I recognize um, women that have trauma all the time from prior birth experiences. Um, and we can help to deal with that, but we have to have a conversation about it. Yeah, I would just add, um, I was gonna say the exact same thing. It, it varies from person to person, but I would also add that we have to look at the intergenerational trauma as it also um, pertains to breast and chest feeding. Um, in the ways in which not just within the individualized experience, but also the community experience in relation to that and having conversations around it, where it becomes more normalized is where it's, you know, it's seen and it's socially accepted, where, you know, but also thinking about the ways in which um, racism, you know, lived experiences, those things have impacted um, the breastfeeding, chest feeding experiences of individuals and their choices. Um, and then chronic health conditions as well. So like, it's, it, I, I don't know about data, but I definitely know I have seen and worked with individuals where it has shown up on various different situations. Um, I'll speak just quickly to the data because I, ju I just finished a study for American 
what is it? Association of Women's Health Obstetrics and Neonatal, Neonatal Nurses, A1. They have such a long tongue twister acronym um, on this very topic. And um, I can tell you what our data shows is that from the ages of 18 to over 40, um, there is a connection between traumatic experiences, breastfeeding, and um, just connecting afterwards in terms of traumatic births. Um, and I would say additionally, in my meeting for the Lactation Commission with the Mayor's Office of DC, we talked a lot about how breastfeeding is not something that's taught to physicians. Like that's one training that they don't get. <laughs> and it was really surprising. And so we're working on making sure um, physicians do get a training or it is a part we, they get training for HIV, they get training for, you know, of course, our changes in terms of um, the LGBTQI plus community, but there's no trainings for breastfeeding. And so that's a real disconnect. Um, it's like something that's expected for nurses to take on and nurses to do, but it's very- Dr. Harris, I hate to interrupt you. Uh, I need to play the bad person here. We are running out of time. We'll get shut off. So uh, thank you so much uh, for your insights and thank you everybody. Uh, this has been like really amazing. Thank you, Trisha, again. Thank you, NGO CSW. Thank you all our fabulous participants. Thank you our fantastic learned panelists who shared so much. And uh, as I said, wove a ta tapestry so well. So thank you all so much. We look forward to further interactions. Bye now. We are going to get <laughs> cut off now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Will we get a recording of this? Thank yes. You. A recording will thank be available you. Thank you. on the event page. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.